Oh, hello folks, it's uh, Ken David Stewart here uh, with you this late afternoon or early evening on a Friday evening. Uh, it's been a long time since I did my last uh, V-blog or video blog. And it's been a couple of weeks, I think, uh, since I've done a little writing on my uh, my novels, novellas, or any of my blogs, my normal blog posts. Uh, I've been pretty busy with uh, with work, doing substitute teaching, and uh, I've been a little tired lately, actually. So uh, I figured I kind of needed a break from it anyway. Uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, books and listening to audio books. Uh, you know, and I also have a Kindle e-reader and a Kobo e-reader, so I, I've been doing a lot of reading uh, the last couple of weeks. Like, any time I, I get, a, get a chance, and I really enjoy uh, reading and listening to audiobooks. Uh, but I did, uh, like I say, I've been working on um, actually three uh, novellas. Uh, one is called The Cover-Up. Uh, one is, I haven't titled yet, but it's something to do with the independent wrestling circuit. Uh, and those two are a work in progress. I'm still working on them in the rough draft stage. Uh, but one I did finish um, called Lake Mariposa. Now, it's historical fiction, and I must emphasize uh fiction uh you know like the usual disclaimer any resemblance to persons living or dead is strictly coincidental or uh you know when i name a city or anything like that it's all fictional it's all stuff that came out of my own mind out of my own imagination out of my own subconscious subconscious it's all characters that i've created on my own so I don't want anyone thinking that they recognize themselves as one of the characters or something. Or it would be merely coincidental. Let's put it uh, put it that way. Pure work of fiction. But anyway, the growing up in the '60s, it was an interesting era, and I'm writing about it from a Canadian perspective, not an American, which is uh, much much different because I think the '60s didn't hit us till a few years. Uh, later in Canada but anyway uh, I wrote a book um, not a book a novella called Lake Mariposa now this too is kind of in its rough draft stage uh, but I'm releasing it now anyway in, uh, in its current format now it's called Lake Mariposa and I'm just gonna read like one part of it tonight it was the year of rock festivals in Manitoba this weekend event would be the third that Rick had attended during the summer of 1969. The famous or infamous Summer of Love had come a couple of years later in Canada. Rick loved these rock festivals. He was a loyal fan of all the local rock bands in the city. To Rick, these musicians were as worthy of his praise as famous bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Rick loved the music of the 1960s. The first single record he bought was She Loves You by the Beatles. He especially liked the garage bands that sometimes had a single hit record during the years 1965 to 1967. But by now it was the psychedelic era. It was Jimi Hendrix and his band The Experience with a beautiful yellow cover on their first LP called Are You Experienced? Rick wasn't quite sure that he preferred psychedelic music to the garage bands but he figured he would soon get used to the new sounds on the radio. You see, Rick was now with it, or hip, or at least tried to be. This process had only come about in the last three months. The inspiration for this desire for hipness came through his association with his new female neighbor across the street. To be more precise, Rick was now enamored with his desire to have a girlfriend. His new neighbor's name was Misty, and she had recently moved to Canada from San Francisco, California. She would have been around 15 or 16 during the Haight-Ashbury Summer of Love. Misty claimed to have visited the original community of hippies on a daily basis. She told Rick that she would have moved right into Haight-Ashbury if her parents would let her. 
If she tried to run away, Misty said that her mother would definitely get the police to bring her back home. She told her parents that she visited the library every afternoon during that summer as she was writing a novel and found the library to be a comfortable place to do research and to write. The more that Rick got to know Misty, the more he realized that she loved to drop names and to stretch the truth, if not make up outright lies. Rick had also heard rumors that Misty had spent some time in a mental health facility while in California. Rick believed there might be some truth to these rumors. Misty loved to tell stories about the good life she'd left behind California. She greatly resented having to move to Winnipeg, but her parents had split up, and she'd chosen to live with her father, Rick, with her father, pardon me, Lloyd. Rick had met her father when he over when he went over to visit Misty. Lloyd had long hair, a ponytail, was tall, had a bit of a pot belly, and when was in his early 40s. He bore somewhat of a resemblance to Pigpen of the Grateful Dead. Her dad played guitar and claimed to have been in a band in San Francisco. He said that his band was going to be signed by a major level, uh, major level, major label, sorry. But his marital breakup had derailed these plans. After the marital split, he decided to move to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, as his parents lived there. Lloyd realized that he had a poor track record for holding down a steady day job, and if things really got tough, he would have his parents to bail him out. Lloyd loved his daughter, but he was not a disciplinarian. That had been his mother's strength. Lloyd was a libertarian at heart, and had trouble even trying to discipline himself. That was likely the reason that Misty chose to live with him instead of her mother. Rick was quite infatuated with Misty, but she did not do, appear to have the same romantic interest in him. She made it clear to Rick that he was not her type, but that she didn't mind hanging out with him from time to time. Rick held on to a hope that at some point during that summer Misty would change her mind. Misty, however, had set her sights on a freak that she had seen while at Memorial Park the local hippie gathering spot in the city. As yet, she had not put any moves on this male hippie of her dreams, but she was making plans to make herself known to him. Rick felt that Misty's problem with him was that he was a straight in her estimation, as opposed to the freak she had seen at the park. At this point, I should explain the meaning of the term freak as it was used in the 1960s. A freak was a synonym for hippie. A freak would have long hair, usually well past shoulder length, or bright often tie-dye t-shirts or a tank top, and well-worn blue jeans with leather patches. It was usually considered mandatory that a freak must use illicit substances on a regular basis. The minimum requirement for a freak was to smoke marijuana. Those who were on a higher level, no pun intended, in the area of freakdom, took LSD, or as it was called, dropped acid. A freak was usually broke and was often temporarily homeless, and would either sell drugs himself or ask passerbys for spare change. Rick could never understand the concept of spare change or especially a spare cigarette. When he bought a pack of cigarettes, there was always either 20 or 25 cigarettes included in the pack. He never recalled opening a pack of smokes that had 27 or 28 cigarettes in it. Okay, that's just a little bit of the intro. And I'll leave it for there tonight, so good night and have a good evening.